comfort of a luxury tour bus. For your chance to say, hey, I'm with the band, try the Big Country Cash instant ticket. I like yo so. Visit a Vermont Lottery retailer today. Please play responsibly. The Norwich University cadets come into the final weekend of the regular season coming off two big wins on the road. Kerner skates with it far side. What a feed from Kerner. In front oh. to O'Mara who scores. That was a beauty and it gives the cadets a three goal lead at four to one. Norwich will host two of the toughest teams in the New England Hockey Conference this weekend. Hobart Friday night, Elmira Saturday afternoon and this is the place to catch all the action. Cadets Hockey is brought to you in part by Packard Fuels, the Good Measure Brewing Company in Taproom in Northfield, Copley Hospital and Mansfield Orthopedics, Shangra Truck and Trailer Repair, and by Northfield Pharmacy. George Como and Craig Durham have the call. Norwich hosts Elmira Friday night at 635 right here on the Rock of Ages WDEV Norwich Hockey Network presented by Northfield Savings Bank. Just because you're away from your radio or out of our broadcast range doesn't mean you have to miss out. Listen live on the WDEV stream brought to you by AARP Vermont. WDEV's morning, midday, and afternoon news services, Vermont Viewpoint, and the Brady Farkas Show can all be found on the WDEV stream at WDEVradio.com. Brought to you by AARP Vermont, working to bring down the cost of prescription drugs for all Americans. AARP.org slash VT. The Brady Farkas Show is produced and funded by WDEV and the Radio Vermont Group. We welcome listener feedback. Email your comments to WDEV at RadioVermont.com. The teams you care about. Well, the Patriots have some soul searching to do, and they've got a long off season now to figure out the answers. The stories that matter to you. Well, UVM certainly put Stony Brook and the rest of the conference on notice with that performance. And now this is the team we wanted to see out of the Catamounts. This is your home for New England sports. All right, football's over. Let's get the lockout over, too. Let's get to baseball. I need the Red Sox back. This is the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV AM, FM, and WDEVradio.com. What's up, everybody? Welcome in. Brady Farkas Show on a Wednesday right here on WDEV AM and FM and WDEVradio.com. Also streaming live on Facebook Live so you can watch the show there with us every single weekday. We've got all 90 minutes of the show today right up until 7 o'clock, and then it's jazz with George Thomas. It's also Radio Row at Home Day 3 for us and now things are really starting to pick up here former Seahawks linebacker Lofa Tatupu the pro bowler he's going to be with us a little after six o'clock former Red Sox broadcaster Tim Neverett is going to stop by at 5 45 we had to switch a couple things up LeVon Kirkland the former Steelers linebacker the all pro he's now going to be with us tomorrow so we're going to bring in Kyle Glazer of Baseball America today. So two baseball interviews, actually. So we get Lou on the text line who says, man, I miss Tim Neverett and Joe Castig. So, look, I love the guys that Red Sox have now. I love Sean McDonough, Will Fleming, kind of the rotating crew they have. Tim Neverett is awesome. He's going to be with us in about 15 minutes. So if you want to get in like everybody's doing, you can do so on the Napa Morrisville, Napa Waterbury text line, 802-585-3026. Also on... Uh, Facebook Live, you can comment in. I get a couple people already asking me, what do you think of the Canadiens hiring Martin St. Louis as their interim head coach? So, yeah, this is relatively breaking news. The Montreal Canadiens fired UVM grad Dominic Ducharme. They have replaced him with UVM product and NHL or and Hockey Hall of Famer Martin St. Louis. We're going to hear St. Louis talk tomorrow to the media, so I kind of want to hear what he has to say. I mean, this is just interesting from a lot of different levels. The Canadians are a mess. They've got totally new management right now, a new GM. They got Kent Hughes in there too. They got Jeff Gorton in there now. So it's a totally new management structure for Montreal. The Canadians are the worst team in the NHL. They've been hit with COVID and injuries real hard. I mean, they shouldn't be as bad as they are, but they're still not particularly good. Last year was, uh, you know, a total um, anomaly. Them getting to the Stanley Cup Finals. It was probably hard to say it was a bad thing, but it gave a sense of false hope. So Ducharme falls on the sword. He's out. St. Louis comes in. 
the interim tag is important here, I guess. So I presume he's got a chance to prove that he can coach at the NHL level and maybe, like Ducharme, get the job long term. He's never coached, as far as I know, above, like, you know, youth-ish hockey. He's never coached in the pros. He's never coached in college. So he's only coached in leagues leading up to that. I know his kid plays uh, in a New England school. He's going to be in the bean pot coming up next Monday in the bean pot uh, finale. So this one's interesting. I'll be very interested to hear what the Canadians say tomorrow and what St. Louis says, to- says tomorrow. Look, he's from Quebec. He fits the bilingual requirement of the job. I don't know how many people that truly want to be head coaches, you know, permanently want to take on this job right now at this particular moment. So if St. Louis is just a seat filler and he can, you know, ride it out and be bad, maybe teach some guys along the way some things, then fine. And if he wants the job permanently in the future, then, you know, he's got a whole lot of work to do to try to turn it around. So there's my initial thoughts there on, uh, On that high ring here, again, of Martin St. Louis. And, yeah, I know, as people said, that they played together. Yeah, Ducharme and St. Louis did overlap at UVM. So, again, we've talked also, by the way, we've got Radio Row at home with all of our big guests today. Tom Kerr and Freddie Coleman we spoke to also. You're going to hear from them in this show. Their full interviews are online on the podcast channel. So the text line is already raging. Facebook Live is already raging. Everybody, Lego. Five, four, three, two... One. And here we go. The opening thoughts are on the Brady Farkas Show, brought to you by Sticks and Stuff and by Swanton Lumber, Vermont's most complete locally owned home center with locations in Enosburg, Derby, Middlesex, St. Albans, and at Swanton Lumber. They're online at sticksandstuff.com. I want to start with the Olympics. Michaela Schifrin, you by now know, she skied out for the second time yesterday. So... She, she skied out of the giant slalom. She skied out yesterday the slalom. That was her best event. So now she, we had thought maybe she could win five golds. We're not even sure if she's going to win any medals at these Olympics. And the, the conversation we're about to have, there's a lot of layers to it. But before we really get into it, I kind of just want to say this to start. My first reaction is that what we watched yesterday of Michaela Schifrin skiing out and then subsequently sitting by herself tears you know that have clearly watered up in her eyes crying in her interview it was gutting it's a multi-time gold medalist the most accomplished slalom skier ever one of the best skiers ever period failing to make it down the mountain for the second time in three days that is just shocking from an athletic standpoint to watch what happened to her yesterday for the second time in three days is just shocking athletically. It's gutting emotionally, though. We talk about sports as the thrill of victory. Well, there's also the very real agony of defeat, and that was on full display last night in those moments. You know, we come into the games thinking that this is Schifrin's games to dominate, and again, We don't know if she's going to win one medal. Heck, I don't even know if she's going to compete in the other three races that I believe she's scheduled to possibly compete in. I felt for her as an athlete, as someone who athletically, you know, just this week has not reached her full potential. I felt bad for her athletically and emotionally. My heart broke for her, and I'm not trying to be, you know, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to overdo it. My heart broke for her yesterday. Those are gutting scenes yesterday. Seeing her sitting by herself on the mountain alone for 10 to 12 minutes probably before a Team USA staff member comes over there and tries to console her. I mean, this is the Olympics. This is what these athletes train all year for. They train four years for this. You only get a few cracks at this. Tom Brady can come back 22 times and try to win a Super Bowl. Michael Jordan can come back. LeBron James can go at this 20 times. They can come back year after year to try to reach the peak. Michaela Schifrin's going to get four or five cracks at the Olympics, and that is it. And I was broken for her. It was just an, in- an incredible moment of vulnerability, incredible moments 
of vulnerability. And you couldn't, if you have any kind of soul, you couldn't help but feel bad for her yesterday. I felt bad for her as an athlete. I felt bad for her as a human being. What we watched yesterday was hard, and it was hard on a lot of different levels. So that was my reaction to it. And then the question now shifts, and the question now becomes this. And I ask you on the text line, and I ask you on Facebook Live, did NBC and the race broadcasters, did they focus too much on Schifrin? Were they too hard on her? Were they too zeroed in on her? Because I went to social media after the fact, and NBC and its broadcast team were getting absolutely crushed. People essentially thought that they were monsters for keying in on her in this moment. We got the close-up of her sitting by herself for several minutes. When they went to commercial, it was a split screen that was focused on her. There was the uncomfortable interview, maybe 20 to 30 minutes after the race in which she still was struggling to keep it together. But what are you still processing? Um, pretty much everything makes me second guess like the last 15 years. Everything I thought of, I knew about my own skiing and slalom and racing mentality. Um, just processing a lot, for sure. And I feel really bad. Um, there's a lot more going on today than just my little situation, but I feel really bad for, um, for doing that. Did NBC go too far in its coverage of her? That's the question, 802-585-3026. I think we can all agree that it was tough to watch. It was tough to listen to. You felt for her in that moment. But did the broadcast team go too far? This is a question I have thought about for several hours today. And I thought about it last night as I was reading all the NBC hate on social media. I don't think that NBC went too far. And it's hard to say because you just heard what I heard. I got emotional watching her get emotional. But I think NBC was well within its right to do what it did. I do believe it's possible for the media to go too far in its coverage or to take a story too far. If Michaela Schifrin had gotten hurt and the camera was fixated on her, that would have been too much. But this wasn't that. This was raw emotion. This was part of athletic competition. Michaela Schifrin is the story. She's arguably the most visible athlete on Team USA, and she's arguably the most visible athlete of the Olympics themselves. The network has a job and an obligation to tell her story, whatever that story is. And, heck, if she does compete subsequently and she turns these Olympics around, they'll be obligated to tell that part of the story, too. This wasn't a situation where she falls down, she's by herself, and the camera rushes to her face, and you know the camera is in her face, and there's 10 cameras there right away. This wasn't that. She had at least 15 minutes to herself on the mountain. She had time to reflect. She had time to correct. They, the, the cut that I just played for you, the NBC broadcaster only asked her two questions. He wasn't out there with an agenda. He wasn't out there trying to make her feel bad. I, I, do, I feel awful for her. I feel awful for what happened to her and for how these games have gone for her. But all the NBC bashing that I saw yesterday, I don't agree with it. She is part of the story. And she is the story of these games, especially for Team USA. You have to show what she's going through, and you have to ask her the question that he asked her. All he asked her was, what are you processing still? He wasn't aggressive. He wasn't malicious. I've seen media members that are that way, and that reporter wasn't. It was raw. It was uncomfortable. It was difficult. She was vulnerable. But it wasn't wrong of NBC to do what they did. Listen, we ask the losing side or the losing athlete 
always to come on and speak after a tough game or a tough match. And they do it. And she's capable of doing it, too. And she did it. I watched the Australian Open final a couple of weekends ago. Five sets, five hours, 75-degree weather and humid in Melbourne. There's Daniil Medvedev losing to Rafael Nadal. And he's got to come up to the podium in front of the entire arena. Ten minutes. I don't even know if he went to the locker room. Ten minutes after his loss. And he had to speak to the entire crowd, and he did it gracefully. The day before, there was Daniel Collins, who I'm, or Danielle Collins, rather, who I believe has only been to one Grand Slam final. And she's got to address the media. She may never get back there again. And she had to go address the media. This happens everywhere. It's always hard but it's part of the deal. I spoke with Tom Karen of Nesson earlier today, and listen to what he told me. Hey, I had to interview Tim Wakefield 10 minutes after he gave up the home run of the 11th mm. inning of Game 7 to Aaron Boone, okay? Uh, you got to do your job. You know, there's, there's uh, again, is it too raw? Well, isn't that what we want? Isn't that why sports is such great television? They're the ultimate reality TV. This happens everywhere. Look, win or lose... Win or lose, the media's job is to cover the reaction. Okay? Win or lose. Super Bowl is going to happen on Sunday. The cameras are going to follow the winning team around in jubilation, and we're also going to get the interview where the opposing, where the losing coach is in the locker room, dejected and despondent, and has just lost the biggest game of their life. And if McVay, if the Rams lose, McVay will have lost that game twice. We're going to get both sides of the coin, and you have to be okay with that. That is the deal. If you hate the system of talking to athletes after games, win or lose, then we can have that debate. But you can't be mad at NBC for doing what everybody does. This is the game, and everybody knows it. When you win, we're there to shower you. When you lose, you answer the questions. The field goal kicker who misses the kick at the end of the game, he stands up there and talks. The pitcher who gives up the homer in the 11th inning like Wakefield, he stands up there and talks. The quarterback that loses on Sunday, they're going to stand up there and talk. And when March Madness comes around in in a month and a half, you're going to see the shot of the kid who's crying on the bench because it's his last college game. I think it was 2006. Go look up Gonzaga losing to UCLA, and there's the camera focused right on Adam Morrison, National Player of the Year after Gonzaga is lost, crying his eyes out. This happens everywhere. Raw, real emotion. The camera was not in Michaela Schifrin's face right after the fact. She had time to herself. Someone said that to me on Facebook Live. I think it was Joe who said, yeah, She had time to herself. She was given that time to breathe. And she didn't have to go to a podium after the fact and talk about it. So there's, I always say two things can be true. I was heartbroken last night for Michaela Schifrin. As a former athlete, even a low-level one who's failed, my God, I I knew what it felt like. And I've never lost a gold medal like she did. Okay, high school baseball games like that gutted me. I could only imagine what she's going through. I felt awful for her, and it was tough to watch, but that doesn't mean what NBC did was wrong. What NBC did was exactly what they were supposed to do. Tell the story. They let her have her moment. They brought her up. They were respectful in their questions. They were quick in their questions. The interview was less than two minutes. This wasn't 15 minutes of harping on everything, and then they let her go. And I think they did the job they were supposed to do. It's the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV, AM and FM, and WDEVradio.com. Anthony says, it's just like what they did with Simone Biles in the Summer Olympics. We're going to talk about that comparison in hour number two. Right now, I want to continue on with Radio Row Day 3, though. I want to switch up gears entirely. So, as we get ready for the Super Bowl, we're bringing on all the biggest names and the best guests that we can find. And right now, we've got ourselves the former Red Sox radio broadcaster, Tim Neverett. A lot of Tim Neverett highlights in the WDEV archives, and Tim Neverett's formerly also worked for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and now he is with the Los Angeles Dodgers. So Tim Neverett is on the phone with us. Tim, how are you? Thanks for coming on. I'm doing great, Brady. How are you? Excellent. I appreciate you being with us. As I said, this is our countdown towards the Super Bowl. It's our Radio Row at Home special week. So let me start here. 
You work in L.A. You work with the Dodgers, who have recently won a title. We know about the Lakers' footprint, USC football. Where are the Rams right now in terms of L.A. fan loyalty? Well, they're getting there. <laughs> uh, remember, they left for a while. Yeah. So they don't have that built-in uh, equity, I guess, that the Dodgers and Lakers have had, even though the Lakers originally came from Minneapolis and the Dodgers originally came from Brooklyn. But the Dodgers have actually been in L.A. longer than they were in Brooklyn. So uh, they, they've really, really ingrained themselves here. It's, it's a Dodger town. It's a Laker town. And you've got the Rams in the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a Ram town now. And even though there's two teams here, with the Chargers, it's way more of a Rams town than a Chargers town. When the Chargers play, usually the visiting team has <laughs> as many fans as the Chargers do. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I think people are really, uh, they're, they're glad the Rams are back, and, and they're glad that, uh, obviously, they're in the Super Bowl, and, and it's going to be at home. You know, I got plenty of baseball things I want to ask you, but I got to go off the beaten path one more time here. We are in the midst of the Winter Olympics right now. You have broadcasted the Winter Olympics in both 2002 and 2006. What was your experience like doing the Winter Games? Great. It was really cool. Uh, first time was in Salt Lake City. Second time was in uh, Turin, Italy, which is the right way to pronounce it. Mm. Um, Turin with no O at the end, yeah. but it's, uh, t- people call it Torino. Uh, it was great. It was a lot of fun. I did uh, men's and women's ice hockey, and I did a couple of other events like 120-meter uh, long hill ski jumping <laughs> qualifying. Wow. Did that. Um, that was pretty interesting and fun. I'd love to do that again. Uh, did uh, women's freestyle aerials <laughs> qualifying one time, which was brand new to me, and I sort of got thrown into it and had about 24 hours to <laughs> learn as much as I could. <laughs> Uh, but it was fun. It was a great experience. I really would like to do it again sometime, but, you know, other things keep me away from it, and uh, it's just such a great experience. And, you know, at that time, politically, it was different, too, because we had just come off 9-11 yeah. um, going, going into the 2002 games. Uh, so security was pretty strict. And the same in 2006. Because I remember the International Broadcast Center was built in a converted Fiat factory. (laughs) Wow. And it was this long building that part of it contained a shopping mall, and the rest was this big convention space where the International Broadcast Center was. There were times it might take 45 minutes just to get through security to get in on any given day. Um, And that was in 2006. And, you know, I went to China to, to do the summer games in Beijing in 2008, and we got breezed through security hmm. there. They, they had it. It was a lot more efficient there. Well, very, very cool perspective. We're talking with Tim Neverett, the former Red Sox radio broadcaster. Again, we've got a lot of Tim Neverett highlights here in the bank on WDEV in our archives, and now he's on the broadcast team for the Los Angeles Dodgers. I do want to get to baseball. I want to ask you about David Ortiz, first ballot Hall of Famer. He's going into Cooperstown this year. You had the fortune of calling his games for a number of years. What stands out to you most about Ortiz? I think just, you know, he's one of those guys who's bigger than life, you know, even when you're around him. I mean, I remember a time when, uh, I can't remember what city we were in, but it was just he and I stuck in the elevator together and just chatting. And, you know, uh, I talked to him a number of different times and spent some time with him. And as normal and as cool as he can be, he's still a bigger than life figure because of what he means in his home country, what he means to Red Sox Nation, what he means to the people that he helps through all of his fundraising uh that he does and uh you know how he's received by by the other players uh, around the game the other managers around the game he's just you know he's a superstar and i was glad to see him get in i thought certainly he should have got in and uh i'm looking forward to his speech this summer i think it's going to be pretty funny what's the big poppy memory or the story that's always uh, the one you pull out at cocktail parties <laughs> Uh, I can't repeat it on the radio. Uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, when he when he was asked to describe my my former radio partner Joe Castiglione, how he describes Joe. I, I can't say it on the radio. It's not not appropriate for work or or young children. So, I, but it's very funny. That, that's the one I will pull out at a cocktail party when I know the audience is. Uh, appropriate for it <laughs> <laughs> well one one day i'll have to come to that cocktail party so i can hear it myself but uh you know 
on the field, the Red Sox are under the stewardship of Hyam Bloom, who's a protege of Dodgers executive Andrew Friedman from their days in Tampa. Bloom has constantly used the word sustainability. He wants to build a sustainable winner. He doesn't want to go for it one time. He wants a sustainable winner. And a lot of people think that that's not possible. The Dodgers have done it. How have they become the blueprint? What are they doing? You know, it's amazing what the Dodgers have done as an organization because you talk about drafting and developing. Yeah, they've got a lot of really good homegrown players on their roster, guys who have helped them win and win a World Series recently. So uh, the drafting and developing part is a huge, huge part of their success. And when you look at the recent uh, rankings, I think Keith Law had ranked all the minor league or uh, organizations uh, minor leagues recently and i believe the dodgers were number one hmm. uh in, in terms of talent coming up through the pipeline and and they've shown it each year somebody's made a breakthrough and uh they continue to get better and better so I, i'm looking forward to this year's crop of guys that that we'll see in spring training that might be able to uh break through into the big leagues this year i think there's a pitcher and Ryan Pepio to look forward to. I, I know this kid, Bobby Miller, I've seen him pitch. He may be a little ways away, but I wouldn't be shocked if he was uh, right around the corner. So they, they've got some legitimate talent uh, in the minor leagues, and they've been able to use that as a point of importance. I think when you look at what some other franchises have done by cutting scouts, firing scouts, shrinking their scouting uh, and their development uh, departments, uh, you know, that hurts in the long run. I mean, they might be saving money now, but what, are you going to be a middle-of-the-road team forever? Uh, You know, when I was with the Pirates, that was the message there, too. It was uh, draft and develop, do things the right way, and we're going to have sustained winning here. Well, they did it for three years, yeah, and that was it. And they they changed, uh, you know, the way they were going to do business again. So uh, you've got to be able to to, uh, back those words up. The Dodgers are able to do that, and that's why... They're a model around Major League Baseball, not only winning on the field, but winning at the minor league level in terms of drafting and developing. On a reflective note this offseason, one of the saddest stories of the offseason is the passing of Jerry Remy, someone who was on the TV side of things while you were doing radio, but I'm sure there's a lot of crossover there. Uh, Do you have any memories of Jerry Remy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jerry, uh, boy, i got memories of Jerry. We... We got along real well anyway. We had known each other before I came to the Red Sox and had actually done some spring training games together when we uh, combined the crews between the Pirates and Red Sox. And so, like, you know, myself and Don Orsillo would split the play-by-play and Jerry and, you know, like Bob Walk would do color on the game. And we had fun. We really did. And then when I got the job, uh, he was one of the first guys to greet me and, and congratulate me. And when I left the job, uh, when he found out I was leaving to go to L.A., he literally was the first person to call me mm. and, um, and, 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 you know, tell me he was sad I was leaving and didn't want me to go because we got along real well. And we, uh, you know, when we traveled together, we sat near each other on the plane all the time, and we had a lot of laughs. Uh, we, knew, we knew a lot of the same people around the game, so we, we had a lot of fun stories to share. And it's one of my greatest, uh, you know, greatest highlights of anything I've ever done is being able to work around Jerry Remy, being around him and just, you know, considering him a friend. I mean, really, uh, really sad about losing them. Tim Never, former Red Sox broadcaster with us here on the Brady Farkas Show. That was well said. And I will get you out of here on this. I'll try to tastefully transition to a, uh, to a, to a nice exit question here. The pandemic uh, changed a lot of us in a lot of different ways. Some people got into cooking. Some people got into housework. You wrote a book around the pandemic. What is COVID Curveball? COVID Curveball is a, a book that I wrote in real time during the 2020 season, shortened season, the pandemic season, of what the different uh, type of spring training was like, what the testing and protocols were like on a day-to-day basis, you know, what it was like calling games off of uh, screens at an empty Dodger stadium with the lights off at night, hmm. uh, what, what kind of wildlife was coming down from the hills of Chavez Ravine when there were no fans around that would greet us at our cars at night, where my partner rick monday was living during quarantine would surprise many um and he maintained that residence until halfway through last season Mm. and most and most fans never knew about it it's it's an incredible uh part of the story but uh just a lot of the things it it chronicled the day-to-day activities of the team how they went about it and how they 
you know, what they had to do to go above and beyond uh, what everybody else did, uh, not only to stay healthy, but to win enough games and, and uh, take off in the postseason and win a World Series. So, uh, you know, it takes you from the start of the real spring training to the quarantine to the re- reconvening and then all the weird things that happened along the way. Well, fascinating read, I'm sure. I actually, that's, uh, I would be very, very interested in the behind-the-scenes workings of that. So it's called COVID Curveball. It's written by Tim Neverett, former Red Sox broadcaster, now with the Dodgers. And, Tim, we appreciate the time and perspective. Enjoy the Super Bowl on Sunday as it is in your new home city, and uh, we'll talk to you again down the road. Yeah, thanks. Looking forward to the Rams doing some damage this Sunday. I hope they do. It would be great for the city. And uh, I know the people in Cincinnati want to see the Bengals. That would be a nice story, but... You know, I work in L.A., so I'd rather see the Rams. So <laughs> see what happens. Well, we understand that. Tim, thanks so much. Okay, see ya. Absolutely. Tim Neverett, former Red Sox broadcaster. Love having him on. Always have. Love his insight. A lot of good stuff on Ortiz. i got to figure out how to get an invite to that cocktail party so I can get that story about Joe Castiglione. Uh, good stuff on Ortiz's personality and... Uh, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So as we're doing all week long, we're going to take all the audio from all of our guests, put them in a big folder, and probably start using it again next week. But those of you who say it's impossible to build a, quote, sustainable winner, the Dodgers have done it. And Tim just told you the formula. So it is possible for Hyam Bloom to hit his goal with the Red Sox. we got two more guests coming up in our number two. But when we come back after the national news update, the Patriots just might make a humongous mistake. I'll tell you what that is after the national news update from CBS News here on the Brady Farkas Show. Radio Row at Home Week, day number three. Patriots, what is that huge mistake? I'll let you know. They just might make it. That's next on DEV. 96.1 WDEV FM Warren. 96.5 W243 AT Berry. 98.3 W252 CU Montpelier. AM 550 WDEV Waterbury. This is CBS News on the Hour, your home for original reporting. I'm Matt Piper in New York, which is one of four states that announced today the easing of mask mandates at indoor public places. I think it should be a personal choice for everybody, but it shouldn't be a mandate anymore. I think the worst has passed. I feel personally that I'm going to be better safe than sorry and continue wearing my mask. I'm Stephen Portnoy. The White House press secretary says she knows Americans are increasingly growing tired of wearing masks. We understand where the emotions of the country are, right? But even as Democratic governors aligned politically with the president remove masks, mandates. Jen Psaki says at the federal level, we're certainly going to listen to our doctors and medical experts. And the CDC continues to recommend universal masking in schools and in areas of substantial or high COVID transmission. Psaki was asked what would influence the president's decision making. He will make the decision based on what the CDC advises. CBS News has learned that the National Archives has asked the Justice Department to investigate former President Trump's handling of White House records. A statement released by the former president says the National Archives and Records and administration arranged for the transport of boxes that contained presidential records in compliance with the Presidential Records Act. It goes on to say, the media's characterization of my relationship with the NARA is fake news. It was exactly the opposite. Brenda Kenyon, CBS News, Washington. Meantime, the House Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol attack has issued a subpoena for Peter Navarro. He's a former top White House advisor for Trump, who the committee says developed plans to change the outcome of the presidential election. The head of the NFL says yes, the league has fallen short on hiring diverse candidates for head coaching jobs. Two minority coaches have been fired since the end of the regular season. Two have been hired. Commissioner Roger Goodell says the league has to do better. Particularly with the head coaches, we have more work to do, and we've got to figure that out. Former Miami coach Brian Flores, an African-American, sued the NFL and several teams after he said his interview with the New York Giants was just window dressing. Goodell says the league has to take another look at the process. With what we should be doing and how we can lead to better results. Peter King, CBS News. A school bus driver has been shot in the head in Minneapolis, and police say three students were on the bus at the time. The kids were all under the age of 10. None of them were physically hurt. No one has been arrested. For those who work at Dolly Parton's Dollywood theme park, a bonus of sorts, all employees will now get free tuition, fees, and books paid for if they want to pursue further education. And that's all across its parent company's aquariums, animal parks, and other theme parks. The Dow Game 305, this is CBS News. 
There's always something new under the sun. CBS Mornings, weekdays on CBS. Folks with inventory issues still affecting dealers across our industry, at Lamoille Valley Ford, we have found the solution for getting you into a new vehicle. Tell them, kid. Thanks, Dan. At Lamoille Valley Ford, we're ready for retail. That's right. We are ready to retail order your new Ford today at Lamoille Valley Ford. With our high-volume sales history, there's no better dealership to custom order your new Ford car, truck, or SUV. We're prioritizing your personalized vehicle and doing whatever we can to expedite delivery so you don't have to wait any longer than you have to. And get this. When you retail order from Lamoille Valley Ford, we will discount your order an additional $1,000. Combine that with huge Ford discounts and incentives, you can take up to $6,000 off a retail order F-150. That's huge. Need a vehicle today? No worries. At Lemoyne Valley Ford, we have by far Vermont's largest selection of new Fords, including over 150 F-Series trucks in stock and incoming. Woo! So drive Route 14, 15, or 16 to Lamoille Valley Ford and Hardwick and save big during our Ready for Retail sales event. Exergen would like you to know about an important study just released by the FDA. It confirms what the medical community has known all along. Non-contact thermometers are not accurate. The study also reports that they fail to meet FDA requirements for accuracy and labeling. We can't afford to tolerate the rampant false temperature readings from non-contact thermometers. Accurate temperature measurements are essential. You need Exergen thermometers because they are accurate and backed by over 100 clinical studies. Be sure, be accurate with Exergen. Learn more at exergen.com. Why does Walgreens offer co-pays as low as $0 and 90-day refills? Because we care about Medicare, so you don't have to. I mean, do you really care to hear me go on about same-day prescription delivery making your life easier? Or how there's a pharmacy expert available 24-7 and one-click refills? Well, I just did anyways. Fill your Medicare prescriptions with Walgreens and save. Zero dollar copays apply to tier one generic drugs and select plans with Walgreens as a preferred pharmacy. Restrictions apply. See walgreens.com slash Medicare for complete details. Make your opinion heard by texting onto the Brady Farkas Show at 802-585-3026. Welcome back to Radio Row at Home on the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV AM, FM, and WDEVradio.com. Welcome back in Brady Farkas Show right here on WDEV AM and FM and WDEVradio.com. Thanks to Tim Neverett for stopping by, former Red Sox broadcaster, current Dodgers broadcaster. We're going to talk in about 15 minutes with Lofa Tatupu, who's a former Pro Bowl linebacker, played his whole career with my Seattle Seahawks. So I might sneak in one Seahawks question for Lofa. Just one. His father played for the Patriots, actually, from 1978 to 1990. So it's going to be a, a cool crossover interview there because Lofa's got a lot of ties to New England and to the Pats as well. So he's going to be with us in about 15 minutes. Napa Morrisville, Napa Waterbury. Text line is always open, 802-585-3026. We've also got some views here on uh, Facebook Live. Here's the deal. If you are watching us on Facebook Live, here's what I need you to do. I need you to listen intently to this. This is something new that we're doing. If you like our WDEV Facebook page, if you share the Brady Farkas Show live feed, and if you tag a friend who you think might like the Brady Farkas Show, well, we're going to give you a chance to win a $25 gift card to the Valley Bowl. So there you go. Something, hey, 25 bucks is 25 bucks. So... It's worth something we're trying out. We're trying to really kind of ramp up our following on the Facebook Live version of the show. We're trying to get the show out to as many people as we can. So we got a couple people watching right now, and I see you commenting out there, Joe and Travis, and we got uh, a bunch of people in there. So Anthony's in there. Anthony's already tagged somebody who he thinks would like the show. So if you like the show, like our page, comment or uh, share it rather, and tag somebody who you else who else you think you might like the show. And uh, twenty five dollars to the Valley Bowl could be yours. We're doing this for two weeks. This contest for two weeks, you'll be entered into the raffle. After the fact, the show is brought to you by uh, or the show podcast rather is available on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. The Patriots might very well make what I believe is a massive mistake. Do you remember? The other day, when we were talking, it was Monday, about how the Patriots can get back to the Super Bowl, I said my number one priority for this team this offseason was to hire the right offensive coordinator. I told you that on Monday. Go, go listen to the Monday podcast. It was the first thing I said. If the Patriots want to get back to the Super Bowl, 
They need to hire the right offensive coordinator. Well, yesterday, the Pats brought back Joe Judge. Remember Joe Judge, the now former head coach of the Giants? They brought him in as an offensive assistant. He's not the offensive coordinator, but he's an offensive assistant. And after I was listening to reaction on that hiring, here's what Ian Rappaport of the NFL Network had to say. Listen closely. I, I would not be surprised, MJ, if they just didn't hire an offensive coordinator. They've done this a couple different times in Bill Belichick's tenure, kind of spread the uh, responsibilities out to different assistants, and Joe Judge now joins officially as an offensive assistant, may get involved in some play calling, maybe just kind of help structure the offense and move to a little bit of a new era in New England. Yeah, this would be a huge mistake. This would be a huge mistake, and to me, there is no other way to say it. I tell you, priority number one is hire the right offensive coordinator. And Ian Rappaport, who's one of the most plugged-in guys in all of football, he tells you the team might not even hire one at all. That one I would not get and I would not like. To me, the only thing worse than hiring the wrong offensive coordinator is not hiring one at all. Look, I appreciate when coaches can have a collaborative mindset. I appreciate when coaches are open to new ideas, when they talk amongst themselves, and I appreciate coaches who aren't closed off to new ideas and are willing to learn. That collaboration, that makes me happy. But the message being delivered to your quarterback, your young, impressionable quarterback, it's got to be coming from one specific voice. It just has to. to how you get to that one message when the coaches are behind closed doors I don't care about the, the Patriots could have 18 different voices talking in the meeting room but the one voice that gets relayed to Mac Jones the one the guy giving the message that gets relayed to Mac Jones that guy's got to be the same all the time one trustworthy voice that's what you need this whole organization's future at this point now depends on Mac Jones's growth and Mac Jones's development. If you want to get back to the Super Bowl and you want to be in a position to win the Super Bowl again, you need Mac Jones to grow. Patrick Mahomes is a Super Bowl contender. He's a great quarterback. Joe Burrow is a Super Bowl contender. We think he's a great quarterback. Josh Allen is a Super Bowl contender. We think he's a great quarterback. If you want to be a Super Bowl contender in the AFC, your quarterback needs to be great. Developing Mac Jones and getting Mac Jones to that level, that is priority number one. And for my money, you've got to be able to hire the right offensive coordinator to help get him to that level. You can't not hire anyone at all. 802-585-3026. Do you think the Patriots can go offensive coordinator list and go you know, I don't coordinator by committee. We see this in baseball, right? Closer by committee. How does that work out for most teams? Not great. Too many cooks in the kitchen is not a good thing. Mac Jones will be a second-year player. A second-year player. He went to Alabama, played for Nick Saban. He's playing for Bill Belichick. Clearly, Mac Jones is a guy who plays well within structure. Plays well within a structured system. And bringing in This opinion and that opinion and that opinion and taking them from everywhere, that's not a lot of structure. I can't see, I'm surprised that works for Bill Belichick. I'd be surprised if it would work well for Mac Jones. Too many cooks in the kitchen is not a great thing. You need the message to be delivered clearly. And when you muddy the waters with all these different voices, that ceases to happen. I want the Patriots in the Super Bowl as quick as possible. The Cincinnati Bengals were picking number one in the draft two years ago and are now in the Super Bowl. The timeline that we've all been used to, that apparently no longer exists. I want the Pats in the Super Bowl ASAP. And the way to get it there is to have a great coaching staff that filters down to very good players. You need an offensive coordinator. Mac needs one clear voice and one clear message. Anthony says it only works as if everybody has the same strategy. They're all going to play in part. You know, all the coaches would have the same system, but is there a different vernacular, a different language, a different way of watching film? I'm not interested in that. I need one voice. Surprising to me, 
Freddie Coleman of ESPN Radio, who was on with me earlier today. That interview is on our podcast channel. He says it doesn't matter. Well, there's always going to be one singular voice, no matter if you don't have the designation, Brady, of having an offense coordinator, because plenty of times a quarterback coach is going to have his say. A running game coordinator is going to have his say, and any offense coordinator is going to siphon those kind of opinions and those kind of objectives to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So it's not necessary in this situation when the Patriot way has always been the sum of its parts. Yeah, see, I disagree. Freddie's far smarter than me, and Freddie's far better at this job than I am. I disagree with that, though. You're, you're going to have multiple coaches. That is true. But the guy that everybody knows is running the show, that guy needs a title. Because if there is no title, then everybody thinks they can bite off a little bit more than they're supposed to. I don't need it to be a coaching free-for-all with Mac Jones having to just, you know, take, take from here, 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 and here. One message, one voice that gets filtered down to everybody, including him. Napa Morrisville, Napa Waterbury text line, 802-585-3026. Neil in Burlington. Brady, I totally agree with you. What do you make of the rumors about Bill O'Brien as the next Patriots offensive coordinator? I mean, it's a logical connection, right? Like, first and foremost, Bill O'Brien is a logical connection to the Pats' offensive coordinator position, right? He, he's worked with the Patriots before. He knows Bill Belichick. He's shown that he can work with Belichick. So, and he's now worked with Saban, who's a Belichick, you know, Belichick's best friend in coaching. So the rumors of interest between the two parties absolutely make sense. You know what my biggest worry with O'Brien is, though, is I worry about what is his plan What is Bill O'Brien's long-term plan? Does Bill O'Brien want to be a head coach again? If he does want to be a head coach again, do you run the risk of him coming in here for a year and then leaving? I know you can't necessarily think that way because that could happen with anybody that you hire, but I've made a big deal about Mac Jones needing and benefiting from stability. Right? And if you bring, so we had Josh McDaniels, then you bring in Bill O'Brien, and then he leaves in a year. Now there'll be three offensive voices in three years. I'm not interested in that. Look at all the young quarterbacks who have struggled. Sam Darnold, Baker Mayfield, Daniel Jones. They've all had multiple head coaches and or multiple coordinators. Instability is not a good thing. And if you hire Bill O'Brien and he leaves, you're just introducing more instability. So that's my biggest worry with O'Brien, I may hate to say that because if he is aspirational, I feel bad like holding him back or penalizing him for that. But I'm thinking about what can benefit my young quarterback and hiring a guy who may leave quickly. I don't know that that's that. If you're going to go that route, why not just go after Eric Bieniemy? Eric Bieniemy is the offensive coordinator for the Chiefs. He didn't get a head coaching job in this cycle. His contract is reportedly coming to an end with the Chiefs. If you just want to go get another offensive coordinator who might be up and ready to leave, let's go get Eric Bieniemy, the guy that everybody is so high on at that rate, and, and just forget Bill O'Brien. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Adam Gase, to me, is an intriguing offensive coordinator candidate. Belichick and him get along. He's been a head coach twice. He got to the playoffs with Ryan Tannehill before Ryan Tannehill was any good. And I think his job, I think his ability to be a head coach, I think that is done. He's not going to be a head coach again. So he might have some longevity to this position, and he might be able to grow alongside Mac Jones. O'Brien is fine and logical. I worried. I would worry if he would be you know, not long for the job. Gase is a guy who I think could be here for a bit. Um, But I know the Patriots have to hire somebody. They have to give somebody the title, and they need to get the hire right. Because we talked all year about Mac Jones walking into a really good situation, right? We We said that multiple times. They went out and spent at receiver. They got a great head coach. They spent on defense. They've got experience, blah, 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 blah. It was a good situation to walk into. If you don't have an offensive coordinator and there's somebody cooks in the kitchen, it's, it's a less good situation. And I'm not interested in that. 
I need now, everything in this organization is about Mac Jones. Everything. Outside of Belichick, he is the most important person in your organization. It's all about him. It's all about his growth and his development. And, look, I can imagine as a pitcher, what if I had three pitching coaches? Oh, that'd be great. No, it wouldn't. It would be terrible. It would be terrible. You've seen this before, right? Like, think about, think about, you have kids. You're driving around. Think about you have kids. I promise you, you have felt this situation before. Mom or dad, let's just say, mom or dad knows more than the coach does. That's a very real scenario, especially in youth sports. Mom or dad, they're telling the kid one thing. The coach is telling the kid another thing. And now the kid doesn't know what to do. Or you go the other way. The coach knows more than mom or dad. Coach is telling them one thing. Mom and dad have no idea what's going on. They tell them another. Kid has no idea what to do. I don't want that to be Mac Jones. Head spinning, unsure, unconfident. Get an offensive coordinator and get the higher right. That is priority number one. I don't want to hear that the Patriots don't have an offensive coordinator. They already don't have a defensive coordinator right now. And... I guess I don't love that, but I can reconcile that easier than not having an offensive coordinator. So it's the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV, AM and FM, and WDEVradio.com. Oh, one more text. This one is from Nelson in Charlotte, who said, Wasn't Joe Judge a special teams coordinator? What would make him qualified anyways to be an offensive assistant? I mean... I, I'm not going to lie. I thought that, too, initially. Like That was my first thought. Like, huh? Well, Joe Judge was a quarterback. Joe Judge was a quarterback in the SEC, I believe, at Mississippi State. And I do remember, now that you mention it, seeing Phil Perry of NBC Sports Boston had a quote yesterday from Bill Belichick from a couple of years ago in which Belichick said that something like he's really smart, he played offense, and uh, he has a good offensive background. So... Bill trusts his ability to understand offense. And I, so I do, too. I just need one singular voice. Um, all right, we're going to get to Lofa Tatupu. We're going to make that who's saying what today. So let's get to it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What did he say? Mac Jones. Good Lord. Mel kuyper has got to slow down on this. Mac Jones ain't going to work, folks. It's not going to work. He's got to come to terms with it. It's not going to work. They really said that? Every damn thing is politics and race. And I'm losing my mind over it. It's time for Who's Saying What on the Brady Farkas Show on WDEB AM, FM, and WDEBradio.com. Who's Saying What is brought to you by Vermont Laser Wash. That's Central Vermont's home of unlimited car washes. It begins at only $20 a month. If my listeners want one free car wash, well, they can just text the word Vermont to the number 30 and then 400. It's Radio Row at home, day number three. I want to welcome in Lofa Tatupu. He's a former Pro Bowl linebacker, six great seasons with the Seattle Seahawks. He's now also the host of a Seahawks podcast on the Believe Podcast Network. Lofa, thanks for being with us. How are you on this Radio Row Wednesday? I'm good, my man. Thank you for having me. Well, I appreciate you being with us, and I want to talk about your career, but I want to talk about your upbringing first. We're, we're here in Patriots country. We're a Patriots affiliate. Your father played for the Patriots from 78 to 90. He was on that Pats team that went to the Super Bowl in 85. Did you grow up a Patriots fan? I did. I did. But I, this will make some of the uh, Patriots cringe, though, the faithful. Uh, <laughs> my favorite player of all time was Thurman Thomas. And so... <laughs> <laughs> the one game I always got, that was back when I thought I was a running back, right? Just like that. <laughs> then I found out I was better at, at, at linebacker, so I chose that career path. But um, So I, I got to go to one Patriots game every year. It was always the Buffalo Bills versus the Patriots. But, but yeah, as far as, so those are my teams, Buffalo, New England, and Seattle. Of course, when we weren't in it, I was rooting for the Patriots. But uh, as long as the Seahawks were alive, man, I was hoping we, we got it done. You know, I know your dad played with Matt Hasselbeck's dad with the Patriots. Were you one of those kids that was always around the locker room and stuff, you know, making friends with the older guys? Absolutely. Yeah, we both of us, me and Matt, we both grew up in that locker room. His brother's Tim and Nathaniel, yeah. too. Um, so, yeah, Nathaniel's uh, the same age as me, so we competed against each other all growing up. But, um, but yeah, 
grew up going to uh, Sullivan Stadium at the time, yeah. you know, and before it got turned to Foxborough and then now Gillette. And um, yeah, those those old hard bleachers and uh, those cold cold games, man. I, I enjoyed going to those when I was a kid. You know, let me ask you a, a Patriots question just to draw on your experience here. The Patriots right now don't officially have a defensive coordinator. They have multiple voices in the room. There's Bill Belichick, there's his son Steve, and there's former player Gerard Mayo. As a player, do you like a collaborative coaching approach, or do you need one specific voice that you're always getting the message from? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I know you never had a situation like this, but I think, yeah, uh, Gerard probably calls the, the run game coordinating, and then um, uh, the son, he, he coaches the, the secondary, and I believe he's doing the passing game coordinating. So uh, I'm sure when it all comes down to it, you know, Bill's got a heavy influence, and, you know, um, they, they know kind of what he wants to run. And I think that's kind of in the past, especially I played for Pete in college, played for him in the NFL, even coached for him for two years in the NFL. But we ran, we ran pretty much the same scheme. And um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, having one voice to, to take the message to the players is important. But when we all break into our own little groups on the sideline, you know, we're hearing it from our, our position coach anyways. So um, I think – you know, he might have an advantage um, having, you know, a fresh set of eyes for the right. secondary and then and then the other for the run game. You know, just if you divvy that responsibility up, it might be a little easier. You mentioned playing for Pete Carroll in college at USC and then with the Seahawks in Seattle. His experience in, in New England as the head coach long predates me being here. I'm just kind of curious about his development as a coach and maybe his transition from the pros to college back to the pros. What was he like, you know, when you played for him in college? Oh, he's the same, exact same. And I think, you know, if, if, if he didn't have the success that he wanted in, uh, in the first years of going at it as in the NFL as a head coach with uh, the Jets and then also the Patriots, I think it was because he probably wasn't allowed to be himself. And um, I think he found his voice along the way. And, you know, but, I mean, he took the Patriots, what, to the playoffs, I think twice. Um, yeah. so, you know, so when, when everybody – now, of course, when Belichick comes right after and, and does what, the run that he does, you know, you look back at like, oh, well, you know, what, you know could Pete have done this? And I, I think he could. I think he's proven it that now that he was up here and the partnership with John Schneider, the GM, is, uh, is really, I really feel like that's the biggest thing for head coaches and GMs to really get along and, and at least have that level of respect heading into the draft, um, who they're going to, you know, sign to extensions, all those things. And I think... John and Pete have done it masterfully over here, and I think. But as far as him as a person, as a coach, he he hasn't changed at all. Not 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 a bit with the philosophy and then how he attacks the uh, you know the coaching. Former NFL linebacker Lofa Tatupa with us here on the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV AM and FM and WDEVRadio.com. You know, we, we had some fun with this idea, with this exercise a couple of weeks ago here again in Patriots country. So I'll bring it to you, Russell Wilson. For Mac Jones and two first-round picks, who says no to that? The Seahawks, the Patriots, or Russ himself? Um, hmm. I mean, I don't think anybody would say no to that. I mean, <laughs> I don't think you guys would. I don't think the Seahawks would because if Russ doesn't want to be here, it, it's going to come down to does he – and I mean, with the defense you guys have, I think he does have a chance, um, you know, to, to go further into the playoffs than, than we have. Of course, he was injured this year. But, um, but, yeah, that's not a bad deal there uh, for either side. Yeah, see, I, I was willing to make it. I actually thought Russ would say no because – I just think that all these quarterbacks right now should want to avoid the AFC. Like, would you want to come to the AFC with Herbert, and Mahomes, and Allen, and Burrow? Like, would you? I think the NFC might be the easier sled right now. It really, it really looks like that. Uh, outside of Aaron Rodgers, um, you know, Tom just retired, so it's uh, well, allegedly retired. Who knows? Yeah, you know? Maybe <laughs> we'll see. You know, I just just read a comment the other day. He said, "Never say never." So it's like, you know what? I, I bet you, give it another like month, he's gonna be like. He's just going to start waking up out of bed doing passing drills around the house. And like, and he's going to be like, oh, you know what? I need to be at the field. And so, You played the Patriots, was it one time in your career? But it wasn't a Brady game, right? Wasn't it a Castle game? It was Castle, my old uh, college teammate. Yes, that's <laughs> right. So, oh, man. What was that experience like for you playing against the team you grew up rooting for that your dad played for? It was special, you know. There was there was two instances in my life where you know you look across the um, the tunnel at the other at the other uh, players and teams coming out, and 
when I was in the Rose Bowl, I looked across and I saw Michigan lining up, and I was like, man, that was that was one of my dream schools when I was a kid. Because, you know, I wasn't, my dad went to SC, so I couldn't like Notre Dame, and I couldn't <laughs> like, you know, UCLA. There were some schools that were just off limits. But Michigan was, they were, they were good every year, and um, just the uniforms and everything, right? And then, so that was, you know, a pretty surreal moment. And then the other one was at home, uh, 2008, when the Patriots came out of the tunnel. And I, you know, I, I watched that team all growing up, and uh, it was special to, to be in that game. It was a lot of fun, too, especially going against Castle, my old teammate. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think we, we blitzed him like 60 or 70%, and he, and he took a lot of shots. But he's, he's still he's a tough dude. He hung in there, and uh, he came away with the win. Um, I think the Reggie Merriweather shot the A-gap and forced the fumble so to end the game. Yeah. Well, here's the kicker for me. You can see we got a video chat here. I'm wearing my Mariners hat. I'm actually from Seattle originally. So despite being Patriots fan by work, I am Seahawks fan by life. So uh, I've been a diehard my whole life. Used to go to the old Kingdom uh, a couple times a year. So I need, I need one question for my Seahawks fandom. Give me, give me a story that you tell at cocktail parties about a teammate, somebody I grew up watching. I gotta get, I gotta get one Seahawks question in here. Uh, someone that you grew up watching. Walter Jones. Yeah. Um, so beyond being the most talented guy, you know, on the field, he is one of the most hilarious guys off the field. <laughs> and so, um, first two years, I don't think he ever, I don't think he said a word to me. And it was, it was awkward because we were captains together and I don't think he even knew that. But <laughs> so we go to the Pro Bowl and, you know, we're at the bar, we're having a good time. And, uh, he looks over and he's like, Hey, yo, Chalupa. And I was like, I think he's trying to say Tatupu, but <laughs> he's saying Chalupa. So I just give it, I give it a second, and he goes, Chalupa. And I was like, all right, he's definitely talking to me. So I turn and I go, yes, Walter? And he's like, you really all right, though? And that was his way of saying I, I was pretty good at linebacker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> and, man. And, uh, and I wasn't going to let him know that I, my last name was the same as a Taco Bell menu item. So... <laughs> I just let it ride. I was like, you know what? I'm just glad you kind of know my name, Walter. <laughs> That's the kind of story that I needed. Absolutely. That is the kind of story that I needed. Lofa Tatupu, uh, the former Seahawks linebacker, a Pro Bowl linebacker, and six great seasons in the NFL. So thank you to Lofa Tatupu as well. That interview will soon, soon be up on our podcast channel on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, Ralph says Brian Blades. If I, He's just naming old Seahawks. Like, if you want to go 90 Seahawks, like, and test my knowledge, like, we could, do, we could play that game. I don't think anybody on the planet wants to play that game except for Ralph, but Brian Blades, Mike Pritchard, Jay Bellamy, Walt Williams, Joey Galloway, Chris Warren... Amon Green, like we can, we can just keep going if you really want to get my mojo going on 90 Seahawks, but I don't think anybody's interested in that. But speaking of Amon Green, by the way, do you remember Amon Green was a dynamite running back, right? He had like six great seasons for the Green Bay Packers. Like really from like, oh, eh, like oh one to oh seven or so, Amon Green was awesome. Amon Green's coming on the show tomorrow. That's right. Amon Green is coming on this show tomorrow, and I'm going to have to ask him, why did it work so well in Green Bay and not in Seattle? Because that could have been us. That could have been us. So uh, Amon Green is coming on the show tomorrow, but thanks to Lofa Tatupu for coming on today. It's the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV, AM and FM, and WDEVradio.com. Show brought to you in part by Pro Driver Training online at ProDriverCDL.com. We started off the show talking about Michaela Schifrin. We talked about if NBC's coverage of her was too harsh last night. I've got a question I think is more fair on the Michaela Schifrin discussion. I'll tell you what that is next on DEV. Hey, it's Karen from Valley Bowl and Randolph with big news. If you want an opportunity to throw about 10 of the newest bowling balls before investing in a new one, then you need to get down here on February 12th. Demo day is back. Brunswick staff will be here to fit you to each ball you want to try and watch you bowl and make recommendations based on your unique style. We have squads at 4, 5, 30, and 7. It's $20 to attend, and will be well worth it to get into the correct ball for you and watch your average go up. Plus, if you buy a ball that day, I'll give you a $20 discount. 
It's amazing what the right equipment can do for your game. We are limiting squads to allow for social distancing, so it's important to reserve your spot. Call the lanes at 728-4525 or email me at karensproshop at gmail.com. Hope to see you at Demo Day, February 12th at Valley Bowl, down under the Main Street Bridge in Randolph. At Union Bank, we've been traveling the back roads and main routes of Vermont and New Hampshire for generations. So when it comes to mortgages, we know the local landscape and the best way to get you home. Union Bank, stay local, go far. Equal housing lender, member FDIC. Hi, it's Tara from Green Mountain Solar. Since day one, our goal has been to provide the best solar experience in Vermont. But you don't have to take our word for it. Here are a few of our customers sharing why they picked Green Mountain Solar. I went with Green Mountain Solar because a friend of mine had a really great experience with them. I felt immediately a sense of integrity from start to finish. I'm a firm believer of getting quotes from multiple companies, so we actually had three companies come out uh, and they answered all my questions and frankly was, uh, he made it so that it was super easy for me, which is, I mean, we're, especially in today's day and age, we have two young kids, so. Um, the easier it is for me, the better. There's just these panels up on my roof, and they do this job of bringing electricity to the house that runs, you know, everything. If this sounds like the solar experience you're looking for, visit our website at greenmtnsolar.com. It, it feels like magic to me, to be honest. For your next celebration, head to Stowe Beverage at the Gale Farm Center on the Mountain Road in Stowe. See their huge selection of beers and wines. Questions about beers? Just ask. They have the biggest microbrewery selection in central Vermont. Find all the sales on selected wines and beers. They're a state liquor store, too, and have the biggest selection around. Stell Beverage and State Liquor Store at the Gale Farm Center on the Mountain Road in Stell. Ask the experts at Stell Beverage. They're here to help. RK Miles is your neighborhood lumberyard. Now with new locations in Barrie, Montpelier, St. Johnsbury, and Waitsfield, RK Miles is a third-generation family-owned business offering lumber and building materials, doors and windows, kitchen and bath design, and so much more. It's time for your project. Stop by one of our four new stores or visit our Stowe or Morrisville locations to get started. Go to rkmiles.com to learn more and to find a location near you. Want Brady to hear your opinion on the sports stories of the day? Text in at 802-585-3026. Welcome back to Radio Row at Home on the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV AM, FM, and WDEVradio.com. Welcome back in Brady Farkas Show right on WDEV AM and FM and WDEV Radio. Dot com. Kyle Glazer for Baseball America is standing by. He's going to be with us here in about eight minutes or so as we continue on with Radio Row at Home here on WDEV. So I want to get right to this. We started off the show talking about the Michaela Schifrin story, and she drew a lot of comparisons yesterday to Simone Biles. Remember Simone Biles at the Summer Olympics talked about pressure and you know having the weight of a country on her shoulders and mental health, et cetera all very serious stuff. So there's a lot of people saying that the Schifrin story was a lot like the Bile story. So my question to you is, 802-585-3026, do you think there's too much pressure on an athlete like Michaela Schifrin? But of course, the media is a part of that. You know, the media is part of building up that pressure. Do we need to back off? And I think that is a more fair conversation than... Is NBC at fault for covering her, you know, her vulnerability yesterday? I think NBC was fine yesterday. The more fair question is, is there too much pressure on an athlete like Schifrin? And here's what I would say. Here's the reality. The reality is there is too much pressure on an athlete like Michaela Schifrin and like Simone Biles. But the reality also is, is I don't know of an easy way around that pressure. There's just... It's the unfortunate nature of their sports. And here's what I mean. The NFL has a lot of stars, star players, star coaches, star owners. The NBA has several stars. There's a ton of pressure on all of them, but there's so many that that pressure can be spread out a bit and the conversation can generally move and shift so one person is not always getting it. 
In the NBA, one week the pressure is on LeBron, and one week it's on Russell Westbrook, and one week it's on Giannis, and then it's on Ben Simmons, and then it's on somebody else. So there's always pressure, but the conversation is always moving. In a sport like gymnastics in Biles' case, or in skiing like Schifrin's case, there's not that movement. The target isn't moving. The target is always on one person, and that is very unfortunate. And look, look I don't blame... NBC. I don't blame any network or media outlet for keying in on the star. That doesn't bother me. The, the problem is the sport itself doesn't have anyone else to turn to, especially in this country. So it always falls back for us on Biles and on Schifrin, and it continues to snowball. That's, that's the problem. The problem is not the network. The problem is the sport not being... Not being popular enough, and I don't mean that in a degrading way or in a bad way. It's just the reality. The NBA, the conversation can turn. In skiing and gymnastics, it can't. And here's what also stinks is that the athletes recognize this. Simone Biles, Michaela Schifrin, they recognize that their sport isn't as popular. So what do they have to do? In order to make a good living, they have to get out there more. They have to be more visible. I mean, the money is established in baseball. Mike Trout can float by and still make $400 million. Kawhi Leonard cannot talk a lot in the NBA and still make a max contract. You can't get away with that in skiing and in gymnastics. You have to be your own brand. You have to be out there. You have to deal with sponsors. You have to go to events. You have to rep your sponsors. You have to do all the press. You, in order to make it financially viable, you have to get out there and help yourself because the sport can't necessarily do it for you on its own. And that is unfortunate. I feel bad that Michaela Schifrin has the target on her back all the time, and Simone Biles has it on hers all the time, too. The, court, the, the pressure, the, the culprit here is the sports they play aren't big enough to where the pressure can shift to somebody else. So these athletes, they need that spotlight to be on them in order to grow and in order to get popular and in order to make money. But then in the blink of an eye, when things don't go well, that same spotlight that brought you up can bring you down. And that's the unfortunate reality of it all. If you're looking for a solution, it's not easy. You need... You need the sport to establish more stars, especially in this country. Because we're always going to gravitate to what we know. And what we know right now is Michaela Schifrin. What we knew going into these Olympics was Simone Biles. And that was it. So, yes, there is too much pressure. There is the weight of a country on their shoulders. And, unfortunately, again, the same spotlight that helped them can hurt them when things aren't going well. It's not an easy solution. It's, it's a tough conversation to have. These sports need to develop more stars so that there can be five or six people in the conversation instead of just one. Even look at men's tennis. We know it's a big three, but at least it's three. It's Novak, Federer, and, 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 and uh, Nadal. Or at least, you know, it was. Federer's kind of out of it now. But, like, you were in a group where you, it's only three, but at least it was three. In American ski racing, there's one. In American gymnastics coming into this year, there was one. And that's what's disappointing. And there is too much pressure. And I do feel bad for all of them. Because they didn't necessarily ask for it. But they knew they had to go out there and do it in order to make a living and in order to get popular. It's the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV, AM and FM, and WDEVradio.com. Okay, I don't know when we're going to get baseball again. So <laughs> I don't know when we're going to get baseball again, but I'm pumped for baseball whenever it comes. And it's Radio Row, day number three. And our last interview of the day is with Kyle Glazer of Baseball America. His team over there is an unbelievable resource for all things baseball. They actually just came out with their farm system rankings last week. The Red Sox were ranked number 11th, which is a big deviation from where they had been in the last couple of years. So Kyle Glazer is with us now. Kyle, Radio Row at home, day three. Thanks for being with us. How are you? Doing all right. Thanks for having me, guys. Well, I appreciate you being with us. You guys just came out with your organizational farm system rankings last week. Red Sox checked in at 11th, which is a nice rebound for them from the last couple of years. So uh, let me start here. 
This team last year went to the ALCS, and I saw fan graphs projected them to be in fourth place in the AL East this year. Are you this down on the Red Sox heading into 2022 as they are? I wouldn't say I'm that down on them. I think they're certainly in contention to win the American League East, but I can also see a scenario where they do finish in third place. The Yankees are really good. The Rays are really good. The Blue Jays are really good. This is a really, really good division. I don't think it's crazy to suggest the Red Sox could be a good team that finishes in third or fourth place. Heck, the Blue Jays won 90 games last year and were in fourth place. Yeah. So it's just a tough division. Before we get to your rankings and talk about specific players, unfortunately right now we can't talk about baseball without mentioning labor strife. I mean, federal mediators, the labor secretary, everybody wants involved here and could, it could get in at any given point. If I set the over-under at 143 and a half games played per team this season, would you take the over or the under? I would take the over because I think Major League Baseball and the owners in particular are desperate to get a full 162-game season. The season just might start late. They'll try and pile in all the double headers or push the playoffs back a little bit. But after not having a full season in 2020, they're desperate to get a full 162 in. Well, certainly hope that you are right. And now let's move over to the Red Sox specifically. I have been a staunch Heim Bloom defender since he got to Boston. And I think that last year he did a really brilliant job of navigating a, a hard, you know, a, it's a hard balance to try to win at the major league level while also building up prospect depth. So how tough do you think it is to, to hit both of those objectives at the same time? It's extraordinarily difficult. A lot of teams really, really struggle to do it. The Dodgers are kind of the one team that's consistently been able to do it. Um, but it's not easy. And then you give High and Bloom and the Red Sox credit. They, you know, of course, have a lot of resources. They have a very, very large scouting staff. They have a lot of money they can spend on research and development. And they also have a lot of money they can spend on major league payroll. So there's no reason for them not to be able to do both. But it's still difficult to execute. Kyle Glazer, National Baseball Insider over at Baseball America. He's here with us on the Brady Farkas Show and our Radio Row at Home coverage on WDEV. My big plan this offseason for the Red Sox has been this. I've said the team should trade Bobby Dahlbeck to a team like the A's or the Reds to get some pitching. Then I think they should sign Kyle Schwarber, let him play first base this year, and then next year he goes to DH when J.D. Martinez leaves. And the reason why this all works for me is that the Red Sox top prospect could slide into first base in 2023, Tristan Cassis. Do you like my plan, and how good is Cassis? Well, so it's certainly potentially a workable plan. The issue is we've seen teams have not been willing to give up a whole lot for corner bats, especially ones with higher strikeout rates. And Bobby Dahlbeck certainly really turned it on last year from June on, and I think is a good player with more upside and feeling ahead of him. I just don't know if you're going to get a whole lot from him in trade. Other teams are just not valuing players like that very highly. And you don't want to trade him unless you're getting a good value for him. I actually kind of think that if Rafael Devers continues to play a really bad third base, Bobby Dahlbeck's a really good third baseman. Mm. He just kind of played first base of deference to Devers, but maybe they can actually use him as their third baseman, move Devers somewhere and figure something out. It just comes back to what you can get for Dahlbeck. Wow, that's fascinating. I had not thought about that idea. Um, we saw Dahlbeck at second last year, I think, at times at the very end of the season. Talk to me about Cassis. We saw him tear up the Olympics. Um, he was great there and was Team USA's best player. How good is he? He has a chance to be a middle-of-the-order slugger. He really, really controls the strike zone, has a really, really advanced feel for hitting for his age, just in terms of recognizing pitches, staying back on breaking balls not being too aggressive, and then really managing the strike zone. And when he gets a pitch to hit, he unloads on it. He's a big, strong dude who can hit baseballs a long way. Uh, he's got some, some pure feel to hit as well. He's not a guy who just goes up there taking giant hacks and hits it a long way when he happens to connect. He actually has an ability to drive the ball the other way, and to hit the ball where it's pissed, all the things you want to see. I mean, in a perfect world, this is a guy who becomes, you know, your starting first baseman who hits, 280 with a high on base percentage gets to 30 home runs and is an all-star contention every year. Obviously, there's still a ways to go. Uh, you know, he got a case AAA last year. It's still a very young kid with some development left. 
but you can see it all clicking for him, and that's why we have him as one of the top 25 prospects in baseball. You know, I think that the Red Sox, in my opinion, they need another outfielder, and they brought back Jackie Bradley Jr. I don't think he's the answer on a playoff team for 162 games. The guy who I'd like to be the answer is Jaron Duran, and I'm not sure he's the answer either. So what do we think of Duran at this point? He's a great athlete who's still trying to figure out who he is as a hitter. He's always been, at his best in my opinion, a guy who's lacing the ball line to line and letting his speed work, more of a gap hitter, you know, maybe a couple balls carry over the fence. The Red Sox obviously reworked his swing at the ultimate training site, got him a lot more uphill, launch angle, and we saw some power come, but against Major League Pitching, the top of the strike zone, he just got exploited. I don't really think power is his game. I think finding the middle ground between let's, you know, drive balls hard, gap to gap, maybe be able to get a couple of them over the fence. I think the best version of Jared Durant is a guy who's 30 doubles, 10 triples, 10 home runs, just putting the ball in play and using his speed. You know, a 20, 20 home run version of Jared Durant. I don't think that's the best version of him. Is he a guy you think is a fourth outfielder moving forward? Is he best served as a as bench depth? Is he best served as trade bait? No, he can still be a starting outfielder in the major leagues, but he's got to figure out the right approach. He's got to figure out the right swing for him. I wouldn't be too discouraged by how poorly things went last year. We saw the gap between AAA and the majors last year become the widest it ever was. You have to remember these guys. The alternate training site cannot come close to replicating a full season. We saw a lot of young players struggle last year. I wouldn't worry about it too much. I think it's more about him finding the right approach and right swing for him. And if he does, he can absolutely be a starting caliber outfielder in the major leagues. Kyle Glazer from Baseball America with us here talking Red Sox. It's Radio Row at home here on the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV. Last year at the draft, the Red Sox were picking in the top five, and I can't remember the last time that that happened. I was really hoping that Jack Leiter out of Vanderbilt was going to fall to the Sox at number four. He didn't. He goes number two. But the Red Sox end up with this toolsy shortstop prospect out of California. California, Marcelo Meyer, he's one of their top prospects already, too. What do we think of this kid? Uh, for my money, he was the best player in the draft last mm. year. And the wow. other teams that passed on him are going to regret doing so. Um, it's not just tools with him. He's remarkably polished. It's a beautiful, sweet left-handed swing, the type of left-handed swing that you just want to watch over and over again. He can drive the ball hard the opposite field. He can turn on velocity and drive it off the wall in the right center with a wood bat. And he just plays a beautiful shortstop. It's so graceful, so fluid. I mean, you can dream of this guy being a gold glove caliber shortstop who's contending for, you know, 300 batting averages and maybe getting 15 to 20 home runs. This is a premium, premium talent. The Red Sox absolutely scored landing him in the draft last year, and uh, he has a chance. It's pretty special. I know this is a fool's errand trying to, to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Does Meyer's ceiling in any way change what you might do with Xander Bogarts. He's got the ability to opt out after this year. We'd love to see him back, but if you're going to bring him back, it's going to be a six- or seven-year deal. Is Meyer the kind of guy that could get in in the next couple of years to where at some point Bogarts would be blocking him, or are they two just completely independent situations from each other? You know, It's hard to predict that right now. Again, we have to see what Xander Bogarts' defense, how that continues to trend. Obviously, he was not great at shortstop either last year. But, you know, as talented as Marcelo Mayer is, this is a kid who was in high school last year. He's only played the complex leagues minimum. This is a four-year journey he's going to be on, and that's if everything goes right. I mean, even if he gets hurt or gets sidetracked and it takes him five or six years, he'll still be 23, 24. I mean, it's a very young kid. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Let's just let him develop. Let's see how Bogart continues to play. The offensively, you know, is a stud. Defensively, we need to see how he progresses and then make a decision, you know, in a couple of years. And we might not even have to make the decision. This is a long way off. Kyle, I'll get you out of here on this. We, we know the big names in the Red Sox system. Is there anybody under the radar we should be paying attention to? You know, I don't know if he's under the radar anymore, but Nick York can just play to hit. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. He's the Red Sox first-round pick in 2020. And at the time, he was considered by a lot of people to be more of a second- to fourth-round talent. And the Red Sox paid him as a second to fourth round talent. He got an underslot bonus, but he went out this year and after a slow start was one of the best hitters in the minor leagues over the last couple months of the season. Again, he's you know, a smaller guy, he's not gonna jump out at you in terms of his physicality or his tools. Um, you know, defensively things are a little rough, but 
the dude can just play and put the bat on the ball and hit, and that's a really, really special skill and one that should help him keep rising. Well, we're looking forward to spring training starting whenever that is. <laughs> we're looking forward to the regular season starting whenever that is, too. So Kyle Glazer, National Baseball Insider over at Baseball America. I recommend you check out all of their work. They are just uh, really a, a, a huge resource for baseball fans everywhere. Kyle, have a great week, and we will talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Kyle Glazer, Baseball America, National Baseball Insider. And one of the best from from one of the best. So one of the best insiders and one of the best publications there is. We don't know when baseball is going to happen. I do like he said over 143 and a half games. The reason why I chose that number was because after the strike in 94, they ended up playing 144 regular season games. Radio Row at Home Day Three is in the books. I went so you know I I packed it with the guests today, so I uh, you know kind of screwed with the commercial breaks a little bit. So I got to get out of here. A little bit early today here, so be out of here in about 90 seconds. But great day of Radio Row, day three at home. Lofa Tatupa was awesome. Tim Neverett was great. Also, as you just heard, Kyle Glazer. Thanks to everybody on the Napa Morrisville, Napa Waterbury text line, which you can always get in on, 802-585-3026. And on the Facebook Live crew, a lot of you made it to the very end of the show. Appreciate that as well. We'll continue growing that platform also. Tomorrow, Radio Row at Home, day four. Josh Rowich, he's the president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. He's stopping by the show. Amon Green is stopping by the show, former Packers running back. And, oh, by the way, LaVon Kirkland is stopping by the show, former Steelers All-Pro linebacker. He's going to be with us as well. So we just keep on keeping on. Here on the Brady Farkas Show, Radio Row at Home. More thoughts on the Super Bowl week itself. I've got some more thoughts on the Patriots and things we're hearing coming out of Los Angeles. So that'll do it for me. Full show podcast, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Jazz with George Thomas is coming up next right here on WDEV, AM and FM, WDEVradio.com. And we're always streaming on the free WDEV radio app. See you tomorrow, everybody. Are you a contractor, electrician, or plumber who isn't at a desk job and hasn't been working from home? 